Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are back with X of Swords. We're on part, technically I think this is part 14. I know we combine, combine two parts together, so I think we're officially one behind uh, what the official numbering is, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're still going in order. For those of you guys who are looking to catch up, you'll find the playlist down in the description, so you're not, you don't feel like you're kind of left out, and because I know we're covering a lot of stories right now, so a lot of you guys may feel a little bit lost. Uh, check out the playlist down in the description, and that will give you everything you need to get caught up on the X-Men. So, uh, what we end up doing here is we pick up with the official start of the tournament, right? The official start of the duel between Krakoa and Orako. And this initially starts out with Jubilee resting alongside Shogo, right? Shogo being a dragon that was once human in form and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, she, it's kind of like her adopted kid, more or less. But the idea is that in the middle of taking this nap, she's suddenly met by a kind of telepathic message that essentially tells her, like, there's not a whole lot of time here. But in case you don't hear back from me, just know that things kind of went bad, right? But I also care about you. <laughs> now this, of course, this message is coming directly from, from Betsy Braddock, right? The new Captain Britain. Kind of a funny thing here, and I don't think he was given an official designation until recently, but Brian Braddock, because he doesn't really wield the Amulet of Right instead, and now he's using the Sword of Might, uh, he's basically Captain Avalon. That's really how that works now. But the idea is that, of course, this kind of telepathic communication is cut off. Now, Jubilee says, if I don't hear back from you by noon, like, I'll come over there, right? I'll come over there and find out what's going on. Now, of course, the reason why this message was cut off is because Betsy Braddock was interrupted, you know, talking to Jubilee, by Iska the Unbeatable. And so it's one of these funny little things because Iska has this kind of conversation where she talks to her and says, hey, like you have the Nine of Swords, right? Like that's an ill omen. And it's kind of like, you know, when we get out there, uh, you know, it, it's not too late for you to quit, right? It's not too late for you to like give up if that's what you choose to do. And the response of Betsy Braddock is like, that's not gonna happen, right? I'm not gonna quit. Like I'm not gonna give up. And Iska's whole idea is like, you shouldn't embarrass yourself out there, right? Like, I mean, that doesn't need to happen. Like just give up now while everything's okay. Now keep in mind, this is not Iska being kind and being friendly, it's her basically taunting Betsy Braddock, right? Like, you can't win against me. So the best thing for you to do is to give up, right? Is to just quit. And it's one of these things where she kind of says, like, of course, that's not going to happen. And her response is, I'm just giving you some advice, right? Unbeatable is not just a name. And and the funny thing is that when Betsy asks Iska, like, your sword's called Mercy, right? She's like, don't get excited. That one is just a name, right? So when we get out there, I'm not stopping against you. Like, I'm not holding back. I'm going to kill you, right? Because keep in mind, this whole tournament is for keeps, right? This is, this is a fight to the death. That's what every single one of these battles is. And so what we end up doing is picking up with the official start of the tournament with a handful of people from Otherworld here. Now, on the surface, it kind of looks like, man, there's like nobody here, right? Like nobody cares about this tournament. The reality of this is that it's being held in such a way to where it's reminiscent of tournaments back during the era of, of like the Dark Ages, not really the Dark Ages, but like Knights and Kings and so on and so forth. That's how these kind of tournaments were held, right? They were relatively small get-togethers, different things like that. They weren't huge. It wasn't like the Roman Colosseums where you would have thousands of of people who were there all lining the stands, they were never really that big. I guess Hollywood's kind of made it look like it was that big, but they were never really all that large in the first place. The other thing here is that Brian Braddock looks like the Burger King guy from those creepy Burger King commercials. I just want to throw that out there. That just needs to be said. I am 100% confident in stating here that was the intention. <laughs> Because he is kind of a creep, and he is a king, and he loves burgers. So I guess it's only a matter of time before they made him look like the Burger King. But having said that, once Iska and, and Betsy Braddock come out here, right on the side of the Krakoa, it's like, come on, Betsy, you got this, you got this, right? But notice Apocalypse. He's just kind of watching this whole thing go down, because he's kind of like, okay, it's Betsy Braddock versus Iska, the unbeatable. What's the likelihood she can actually win here? And then once the fight starts, right, like you have Apocalypse who kind of chimes in and says, you know, where, where Captain Britain's like, man, she's got this in the bag, the response of, of, of Apocalypse is, well, I've learned not to underestimate the, the heart and, and trust, like to trust in the heart and the passion of young people. But understand, Betsy Braddock is not that old right? I mean, she's not, she's not been around as a fighter for a very long time. She was a telepath. She was an X-Man. Sure, she has the powers or the ability she had when she was Quanon for a little while, when she switched bodies with that Japanese ninja. But Iska has been alive for centuries. Her skills have been honed for centuries. This is a girl that does not have the ability to lose and has also been fighting with a sword for longer than most all of you have been alive, right? The only person here that I would say has been alive longer than Iska or anywhere close to however long Iska has been alive is Apocalypse. 
lives. Everybody else here, every single X-Man, every single every single person from Krakoa has been alive that long, right? Seemingly the blink of an eye in all of uh, Iska's lifespan. And so when that happens, once the fight kicks off, things go kind of bonkers, right? Because you have Betsy Braddock who's sort of intimidating a little bit and saying you can't lose. That just means you never learned how to win a fight or never never learned how to fight anybody at all. And Iska's like, okay, cool. Let me prove you wrong. She literally attacks and shatters the swords of Betsy Braddock, which in turn shatters Betsy Braddock herself. The whole fight is over that fast. Like it was literally two hits, right? It was Betsy Braddock hitting Iska and then Iska hitting Betsy Braddock and then Betsy Braddock was destroyed just that fast. And so from there, Saturnine steps in and says, the fight really over that fast? Well, that kind of sucks. Like, I mean, I was expecting it to be a little bit longer than that because apparently she ended up showing up here late. Now, a lot of you guys are going to look at that and say, that kind of sucks that the fight is over that fast, right? There should have been more to it than that. That's going to be a common theme, not because of the fact that Jonathan Hickman is cheating us out of a story, but because there's actually some pretty nefarious stuff going on here. And we'll find out more of what that looks like here in a little bit. But from here, we switch over to Doug Ramsey, right? Over to Cypher and his card gets drawn, which means he's supposed to be ready to fight. But the response of Saturnine is like, you know, this little party that we're having, it's definitely going to be a challenge. And your friend here better get used to learning how to speak every language and he better learn how to do it fast. And the reason why is because he's kind of led away by a handful, by like three gorgeous girls. Now, I don't understand this about Cypher, right? He's literally being led away by gorgeous girls. And he's like, hey, let go of me. Where are you taking me? Guys, help. Not me, man. If, if like, if I were a single man and I was being led away by three gorgeous girls, I'd be like, yes, ladies, take me. But uh, at the same time, they also end up taking one of the one of the fighters from Morocco's side. And so where they where you initially have like Storm, maybe a couple people who interject and say like, we have to do something. The response of Wolverine after that vision that he saw, because I had a lot of, uh, a couple of you guys asking this question, um, nothing that Wolverine saw actually came to fruition. It was a glimpse of what could happen if he actually did kill Saturnine or if Krakoa lost the tournament, right? So it was just kind of a glimpse there. Uh, so again, it was all basically in his head, but you end up having, you know, Storm who kind of challenges that and Wolverine's like, no, like we are not going to turn against the rules. If we win this, we have to win legit, right? Anything other than that, and we will, it'll lead to the ruin of all. And so these girls are kind of, kind of lead Cypher away. <laughs> they lead this, this other, this other chick away. And then from there, they take him into a kind of tent of sorts. And it's kind of nuts because Brian Braddock looks to Apocalypse and he was like, like you had me worried that Betsy Braddock would be humiliated, not destroyed. And the response of Apocalypse is, are you really that stupid? We came here at a tournament that's literally designed to, de to determine the fate of our, of our dimensions. And this is obviously a fight to the death. Did you really believe that nobody was going to die? Did you really believe that was going to happen, Brian Braddock? Are you really that dumb? Like, it's, it's kind of funny, right? <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. But he's like, I don't know why you ever thought this journey would be without sacrifice, right? Some of us will return home changed. Some of us will not return home at all. Now, this is an important thing to understand here, because remember, with Betsy Braddock basically being destroyed, more or less, that means if they try to resurrect her in Krakoa, that she'll come back a different version of herself, right? This is this is one of the things that I'd mentioned when they previously introduced this at the very beginning of X of Swords. This is a way for Marvel to soft reboot, right? And that's what we see happening a lot, right? Over the years of Marvel Comics, those of you guys who don't, who don't really get that, over the years of Marvel Comics, their way of rebooting was totally different from DC's. DC would not really soft reboot characters. They would hard reboot, right? They would do event like Crisis on Infinite Earths. They would do something like, like Infinite Crisis or New 52, which honestly, Crisis on Infinite Earths and the New 52 are the only times that DC really hard rebooted their entire landscape. Uh, but what you'll get after those are mini crises, right? So you got Crisis on Infinite Earths and then you got Zero Hour, then you got Infinite Crisis and you got Final Crisis. Those were designed to basically fix plot threads that had been left over after the events of, uh, of Crisis on Infinite Earths. You also get stories like Blackest Day, Brightest Night and the Green Lantern mythos. That was a soft reboot, right? You get these small little things that are done here and there in DC to kind of bring small things back or change characters or something along those lines. In Marvel, that's all they do. Marvel never hard reboots, right? Marvel's never had an instance in the history of their publication line when it was like, you know, Marvel number zero, or, you know, Spider-Man number zero and this guy number zero, Iron Man number zero and Captain America number zero. And it was just a line wide reboot. That's never happened. I think it's a problem that's never happened, but that's never actually happened. Instead, what Marvel does is stuff like this, right? So if Marvel, if, if Jonathan Hickman wants to rework, you know, Betsy Braddock, if you looked at her character and he says, okay, over the years, she's kind of grown stagnant and her history has been really weird and really shuffled and it's kind of been a, a hassle to follow because it has, right? Is anybody, let me tell you something, man, anybody who knows anything about the publication history or even the, just the in-universe history of Betsy Braddock will tell you, it's a hassle, right? It's an absolute nightmare to understand that. Uh, but if Hickman sits down and looks at that and says, yeah, we should rework Betsy Braddock, this is the way they do it, right? She dies here in Otherworld, which means that they can't bring her back the way she was when they resurrect her. It'll just be some random version from of herself from across the, the multiverse, which means whatever version we get, 
is gonna more or less be a soft rebooted character. She's gonna have a whole new history and all that kind of stuff, right? She's gonna have to learn to probably reintegrate herself back into the X-Men. Things are gonna be different. We might even get kind of a little bit of history of her own universe along the way. But whatever it is, she's gonna come out different than she was before. The only exception to that is if she's somehow reconstituted here the way she was and nothing's changed at all, right? But if she stays dead and they resurrect her in Krakoa, then it'll be a soft reboot of her character, right? So just kind of something to keep in mind. Now, where Douglas Ramsey is led away, right? This other person from Araco that's led away is a woman called Bay the Blood Moon. And the idea behind this is that Bay has a set of powers that are almost identical to the powers of Black Bolt, of the Inhumans, right? Then in the, the, what she can do is she can basically release something called a Doom Note. And this is essentially just a giant concussive force of energy that comes out of her mouth in the form of her voice. But what she's learned is that over, over time, it's not necessarily just like Black Bolt, right? In the sense that when Black Bolt speaks, he's got a quasi-sonic scream. So he cannot talk and not scream at the same time. The only way for him to do that is to like transition his essence to a different realm or for Doctor Strange to create some kind of pocket place where he can talk and his powers are neutralized or something along those lines. But if he's just walking down the street on Earth or traveling anywhere within the normal universe in, in the main Marvel universe, if he talks, he's going to kill somebody. With with uh, with Bay, what she learned is she has that power, but she can also talk at the same time. So she can channel it at any point in time. So think of it like a vocal version of Cyclops's optic blast when he's wearing his optic visor, right? That he can look around when he has his optic visor on, but he can also channel his powers if he wants to at the same time. That's kind of how that works. And so because of this, uh, one of the things that goes on with this Doom Note is that it works a little uniquely with Doug Ramsey in the sense that Doug has the ability to understand any language, but he can't understand hers because hers is a language that doesn't exist within the main Marvel Universe, right? I mean, I guess it does, but Araco has been so far removed from anything in the main Marvel Universe. It's a language nobody in the universe has ever encountered before. And so because of that, the Doom Note itself, the, the kind of power in the voice of Bay desires to be understood, right? It wants to be, it wants somebody to, to hear it and to understand what it's saying. But the, the words she speaks are not really a true language and she cannot, it cannot really be translated. And so it's almost kind of like this vocal slash linguistics version of a an immovable force meeting an unstoppable object, that kind of a thing. It's it's kind of crazy, you know, with this, this little bit of a thing here, but the whole reason why they're being brought together is really kind of brought to bear when you have uh, Magic visiting Doug and the two of them kind of start talking about what's going on and he's like, I have no idea what's happening. Like what's what's going on right here? And she's like, well, Brian's pretty inconsolable. He's pretty pissed off and everybody else is as well. Uh, they're just kind of, you know, mingling with the, the Iraqi people a little bit more, but no one really feels friendly towards Iska, right? They're all kind of pissed off at her because she killed Betsy. But uh, as they as the doors open and they start to step in, that Doug realizes, oh my God, like Bay's not gonna kill me in a tournament. She's gonna marry me. Like it's literally a marriage that's kind of been assembled here. Now, here's a funny thing about this, right? Teeny Howard plays this fast and loose. It's just kind of like, okay. Like Doug's like, all right, cool. I'm gonna get married. Now here's the thing, man, right? Like you see the two of them standing next to each other. This is a big woman, right? And not, terms of, not in terms of girth, but just in terms of like physical size. She's like what? Maybe like two heads taller than, than Douglas Ramsey, right? She's got maybe like a foot on him. All right, let me tell you something, Cypher. She's gonna make a man out of you. Man, I can't. <laughs> yeah, she is. She's gonna, man, she's gonna make a meal out of him. <laughs> you better be ready. But, uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> this is kind of a crazy thing because the time comes for them to like make their vows. And he's like, I mean, I didn't prepare any vows. And Saturn, he's like, well, then you better prepare them. You better, you better do a quick fast and in a hurry. And he actually makes these pretty amazing vows on the fly, right? He says, bathe the blood moon, right? This is a little absurd because I don't know anything about you, but you're gonna be my wife. So I swear to uphold my vow to you for the duration of this challenge or whatever, right? However long it goes after. And I'll always be grateful that we got to do this instead of sword fight because I'm not really ready to die. <laughs> They're not bad vows, right? Now, in response to that, uh, Bay offers her vows, which are really good as well, right? She says like, when the grim fog of bloodshed overtakes us, the beloved is the beacon that returns us to our best ourselves. Love is a fealty that cannot be broken. I will love you with the force of the wave that crashes the shore like the current that swallows the sand. This is kind of cool. It's pretty interesting. And so he's kind of like, I mean, I don't really understand anything you said. This is really, really fascinating. And then she she, peel, she pulls back the veil and, uh, and Doug's like, man, she's super hot, right? So he's just immediately swept up and how gorgeous this girl is. And so from there, like in the middle of this wedding, fire just goes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Fire just gets sprayed everywhere. And here comes Jubilee riding Shogo. And everybody's like, Jubilee, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing here? Like, you're flying in here with a dragon? Like, here comes a clue train, Jubilee. The last stop is you. This is not a good idea. <laughs> 
You should not do this. You should not fly in here with a dragon and start breathing fire everywhere. But Jubilee's like, well, I told Brad, uh, Betsy Braddock if I didn't hear from her by 12, that I'd come over here and see what's going on. Now, here's the crazy thing about this is keep in mind, Shogo's dragon fire in Otherworld has the ability to melt that reality, right? He can literally destroy the physical principles of that reality. And so when, when you have, you know, Wolverine, who's kind of like, hey, man, it's kind of cool. This dragon's coming here and he's going to burn the place down. The response of Apocalypse is no, that's not cool at all, Wolverine. That is not by any means a cool thing. I mean, maybe a little bit. Maybe it's like a little bit cool, but it's not as cool as you're making it out to be, right? Because this dragon will destroy the reality in which we live, right? And we will all perish along with it, right? So killing us is the least of what this dragon can do. It's kind of a cool little a cool little thing there. Now, while all that's going on, uh, Cypher is kind of like, okay, like he's talking to Bay. He's like, are you going to go out there? She's, and she doesn't really say anything, right? He's like, are you really going to go out there? And are you really going to, you really going to do all this? But like, I mean, if you do, here's the thing, like, don't kill, like, don't kill the dragon. The dragon's cool. It's like a little baby, right? Like the dragon's cool. Like, don't kill the dragon. She immediately turns around and kisses him, right? So here's, here's what I'm going to bet, right? I'm going to, I'm going to bet this here. And I'll tell you what, if I'm wrong, I will give out three Rob Core rings, right? I will give three Rob Core rings for free, which by the way, for those of you guys who are asking, uh, we're going to start selling them. I'll make an announcement later, but I'll give out three Rob Core rings for free. What I'm willing to bet here is that the time's going to come when it's time for Cypher to fight and she's going to fight in his stead in every single match that he has, that I doubt the two of them are actually going to have to fight each other. And if they do have to fight each other, she'll sacrifice her life for him. And then Cypher will basically be the one who wins the tournament. He'll come out on top and he'll be the one that saves, saves Krakoa. I will bet that. I will bet that's exactly what happens. I don't know if it is, but I will bet that's what happens. Now, the cool thing is that once Saturnine shows up here and realizes what's going on, she's pissed, right? She's, she's eight kinds of pissed off, right? Just, she's, she's mad as hell, right? She comes, she comes walking out here. <laughs> And she's like, no, like this is not going to fly. And it's, and it's one of the, well, no pun intended, but it's one of those things where like she almost intends to destroy it. But then you have Wolverine who kind of chimes in like that baby's going to hurt Storm, right? And that's when Saturnine realizes, oh, that's right. It's a baby. So she uses her magic and then manipulates the mind of, of Shogo in order to bring him to her and bring him under her spell, right? She also kind of dis dissipates his dragon fire. So it can't really destroy anything inside of, uh, in anything inside of Otherworld. But it's one of these things where she makes this comment where she was like, you know, it's lucky that I'm in a good mood today, right? Because if, if you had actually flown Jubilee here, I would have killed her in front of everybody, right? I would have killed her in front of every single person here. And so it's a little bit, a little bit nuts because from there, you know, once everything kind of settles down, that it's like, okay, she's like, I'm in a good mood, right? I got my drinks. We got a wedding. We have cake, right? One point for each side, right? Like one point for each person. And that's where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> so in the first match, right, the first day of this battle, which I won't even lie, this story kind of went off the rails. In the first day of this battle, uh, Betsy Braddock died in two hits and oh, really just with one hit and Cypher got married to a chick he doesn't know. So yeah, that's kind of where we are now. Here's the crazy thing about this. It's only going to get crazier. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.